Okay. Sounds good. Can people hear me out there? Maybe not. Maybe not. Oh, do I? Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? Maybe I'm wearing it. Am I wearing this in the right place? Oh, now I can hear it. Okay. Okay. I. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It, yeah. Sure. That's fine. Yeah. Okay. I really don't like the. There we go. Yeah, we're going to get started here. Uh, I'm just going to give our little introductory spiel. Um, I will coordinate the off webinar series with Alex, Hannah, um, Ilsa, who's not here, and also Kenny, who's not here. Um, uh, and yeah, we put these together, we have lunches, and speakers that come in just once a month. Um, first, I just want to acknowledge that we are on the territory and the homeland of the Métis. Um, we pay our respect to the First Nations and Métis ancestors of this place and reaffirm our relationship with one another. Um, so a little bit about our speaker, Tyler Lockhart. Um, Tyler is a population ecologist and conservation biologist interested in understanding the factors that influence changes in animal populations and applying decision theory to design optimal management strategies for species of concern in the face of global change. He holds the Bachelor of Science in Environmental Sciences from the University of Alberta, a Master's in Biology from the University of Saskatchewan, and a PhD in Integrative Biology from the University of Guelph, um, and is a Lieber Arrow Conservation Fellow. His two big topics of conservation science include conservation of migratory animals and the complementary management of free roaming cats and dogs. Right now, he is working on developing evidence based population models for cats and birds to make optimal decisions to both improve cat welfare and reduce the impact of outdoor cats on birds. Uh, future goals are to fully integrate population dynamic models, uh, conservation decisions, and economic models to aid the French discovery of ecological benefits and identify opportunities for conservation arbitrage. Um, he lives in Saskatoon with two kids, one wife and future dog. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, he plays a beer hockey league and runs two small businesses and is attempting to grow a hundred plant species boring forest garden in his backyard. Mm -hmm. um, so further, without further ado, I will introduce, oh, bring on stage. <laughs> 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 Thanks. I should have just made the the uh, the bio like he likes to solve problems. Yeah, it would have been way faster, way faster. Yeah. So I like three years ago, I got to talk about my garden. Three years ago, I we moved into our house four years ago, and I was like, oh, we got to have a boreal forest in the backyard because that's like my eco zone. Uh, easier said than done. And growing things from seeds is hard. Um, but growing like corn is like really easy, right? So the ones you buy at the store, all that stuff is like meant to grow. Boreal forest plants, wild stuff, total pain in the butt. So I highly encourage you to do it. And if you ever want to come over and see a real boreal forest in my backyard, come on over. Okay, so I'm going to talk about population dynamics of migratory animals. During the lunch, like quite a few of you sort of mentioned that this is what you work on. So I'm really interested to sort of hear your feedback on this because the approach I think is very different uh, amongst different sort of research groups or philosophies or whatever. And I'm gonna sort of pitch my idea of how I think of these systems and the models that I use to do that. But I'm also gonna interweave a lot about, um, you know, being a graduate student and maybe being a faculty member or being a professional scientist, which you all will be, and how it like, it's a lot of work and it's really hard. But like anything in life, you're gonna fall down, you're gonna be uncomfortable and you're gonna take risks. But that's kind of, uh, well, that's not working at all. Uh oh, what did I do? If I click on the screen? 
Oh, wait a minute. There it is. See? Problem solving. I love it. Okay. But as I was putting this together, my wife's like, oh, don't be such a negative person. Be happy. I was like, okay, let's talk about getting up, being bold, and thinking strategically because you guys all do this. Even though you, you don't think you do, you do. Um, and I like to think that these are sort of th three things that I'm really good at. I get knocked down a lot, but I get back up, especially in beer league. Um, I pitch really big ideas. And my philosophy is, oh, it can be done. Nobody's just done it before, but I can do it. That's fine. And the third is thinking strategically. Set yourself up for that next thing, right? And you guys probably do that in your graduate work. You're setting yourself up to get into a master's program or to get into a PhD program or get into a postdoc position or a faculty position. You're setting yourself up, right? So being strategic about it. Did I break it again? Uh-oh. Let's see. Let's see if this works. Let's just do this. Okay. Oh, it jumped, it jumped ahead now. You know what it is? It's probably like my file is so big that it's like, nope. <laughs> nope. You're a guinea pig for the new room. Yeah. yeah, maybe, right? Yeah. It's okay. This is part of it, right? Is like preparing for the worst. And I've always thought to myself, like, if it falls apart, if I get to a conference, like the conference where I'm like making the pitch, right? Nobel Peace Prize or whatever it is. Yeah. And then the whole like PowerPoint thing goes down. Can you, can you hack it? What's the plan? My plan is always just to start writing equations on the board. <laughs> This is not working at all here. That's right. Okay, can you can you go back a couple? You know what? Don't even go back. Just we'll just keep going. <laughs> all right. So uh, migration. So I study mostly birds, a lot of monarchs. Uh, but other sort of migratory animals as well. Um, and imagine a picture up here, beautiful picture with uh, other insects and whales and jellyfish and other things that migrate. You guys all know this, right? The diversity is enormous uh, for migratory animals, but the question remains the same. How do you conserve these species that move over distance between seasons uh, and have different dynamics in different places and are interconnected, right? And so when we think about this, we might think about uh, a red breasted or uh, American red start who should be spinning around the globe as we speak, but is not. Oh dear me. There it is. Okay. The bird, the bird is migrating. Good. So over the course of the year, right, American red start or your critter of interest is moving between breeding areas and non-breeding areas. These areas may be separated by thousands of kilometers or dozens of meters, perhaps, depending on the species. But the situation remains, and that is they're moving across space and time through different habitats. Um, and importantly, and that's something that we talk about a lot, is they move between different countries, right? But the next step of moving between different countries is that there's different laws in those countries. And most of those countries have laws regarding species at risk and the actions that have to happen. So think of the Species at Risk Act in Canada compared to the Endangered Species Act in the United States, right? Are they the same? They're not the same, right? What are the requirements under each law? They're totally different, right? ESA is way more powerful than what we have in Canada. But how does that work? If I'm conserving a species that goes from Canada to the US and it's listed as endangered in one place and shoot at whale boys in the other, what does that mean? How are we supposed to reach objectives in one or both countries if we have totally different legal obligations for those species? That's what keeps me awake at night. Okay, in the same sense, we, come, we start as little kids that really like to be outside. We like to study critters. We like to catch butterflies. We like to uh, progress in our career, right? And at any point in time, 
that American red star can get picked off by a peregrine or by a sharp shinned hawk or whatever, we can carry along in our life and we can fall down as well, right? Things happen. Good things happen, bad things happen, but things happen and you have to sort of deal with it, right? And usually we're not talking about dying because that's way too morbid for this um, conversation. But the idea is, is that things are going to come up as you go along, right? And how do you deal with it? The same way that things come up for migratory birds as they go along. And you don't ask them how they deal with it. They just deal with it, right? Either that or they die. But it's the whole sort of cycle of things. So I started thinking about um, conserving migratory animals with respect to Canada warblers. But I focused on monarch butterflies. And I did that for a couple of reasons. One, because they're insects. They're way easier to study. Like you can do experiments on insects and nobody is going to bat an eye at all, right? And it, like it sounds really bad, but think about being strategic, right? Like if you want to do in-depth work where you actually want to know functioning mechanisms and how they operate on population dynamics, you need to do experiments, right? It's really hard to do experiments across North America on tree swallows. I love tree swallows, right? Can you imagine trying to do like an experiment across North America? It's hard. If anybody in this room is doing it, you have my like utmost respect, but it's really, really hard, right? Now imagine things like density dependence and feedback and competition. Can you imagine trying to get that through animal welfare, right? No, like it doesn't happen. So I said, well, I'll, I'll study bugs. Bugs are fun. And everybody loves monarchs. I have yet to meet a person who dislikes a monarch. Get out. <laughs> You're not allowed. How can you dislike a monarch butterfly, right? They are two, they're charismatic mini fauna. I know it's true, right? Okay, so let's talk a little bit about monarchs. Anybody from out east? Yeah, a couple of people, right? You guys know monarchs, right? This is what you guys do for... Uh, elementary school, you raise them, right? If you're my kid, you let them out, take the lid off, and they all crawl out. And he, he bragged about it, and I got in big trouble. Anyways, so here's the annual cycle of monarchs. And I'm focusing on Eastern North America. So over here, Mexico, the US, and Canada. So these butterflies overwinter in Mexico. They overwinter in these like huge, dense colonies that you can see here. These are butterflies. This orange, this isn't even dead trees. Those are butterflies. And they congregate like this. Um, and if the world was to turn it a different way, I actually would have been in Mexico last week looking at this, but you know, life, the way life happens, it's just the way it happens. Um, but starting next month in March, they're going to start moving north. They're going to move out of Mexico into the Southern United States to this sort of greenish area. And that's where they start laying their eggs. Those adults die. Those eggs develop into caterpillars. They develop eventually into flying butterflies. Those butterflies, you close and they start flying north again. What you have is this migratory um, cycle where over successive generations, they move north over the breeding cycle all the way up to southern Canada, breeding along the way. In the fall, depending on the latitude, they eclose, that means they come out as uh, adults in reproductive diapause, which means that they don't breed. And those individuals are the ones that fly all the way back to Mexico. So some of them fly 5,000 kilometers from the southern Great Lakes, southern Canada, all the way down to Mexico, and that happens over the course of three or four months. So all of this is to say is that we have a quite a complex system of both population dynamics and life history. We have different uh, sort of age structure, different parts of the annual cycle, and it goes between these three countries. And they use very different habitats depending on where they are and the type uh, and the portion of the season. So in Mexico, they are relying on these old growth forests that are very high elevations, really important microclimate, right? It's just above freezing. So it's low enough that they're not really burning very much fuel at all because they've collected all the fat on fall migration. So it's cold enough that they're not burning much fuel, but it's warm enough that it doesn't kill them. But storms go through, but once every 10 years and wipe out anywhere from 10% to 80% of the population. So you end up with billions of dead butterflies. And there's pictures of people lying in dead butterflies when this happens. It happens occasionally, but it's a stochastic event. And it's just part of the system, right? Does that suck for a migratory species? Yeah. Does it really suck for conservation of that species? Yeah, it could, right? But it's just part of the, part of the deal. 
During the breeding season, they're using milkweed plants. These are common milkweed plants in uh, Wisconsin. This does milkweed plants in Southern uh, Texas, different species. There's about a hundred species of milkweed that they might use, but generally these are like uh, weedy species. They usually grow sort of in disturbed areas. They're not uh, particularly hard to grow. They grow sort of everywhere, but because they're a weed species, they've actually been uh, the focus, particularly over the past 40 years, of uh, removal from agricultural fields, particularly uh, in the United States. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later on. Okay, so when I came to uh, thinking about monarchs, we were sort of right in here, it was around 2009. And at that point, the population was, was declining. And so I sort of showed up at, I thought, lucky for me, un unfortunate for them, uh, at a time when it was sort of obvious that this was a population in trouble and that there was going to be more attention focused on it. We did have long-term data, and we still do. People have been collecting these overwintering population sizes for almost 30 years, um, and there was an obvious need for it. So I should explain this population sizes in hectares. What they do is the biologists go out to these really dense colonies. They walk around the outside, and then they add the different colony areas together to collectively have one large area. More area, more butterflies. There's probably about 20 million butterflies per hectare, just to sort of give you a, a nominal sense of it. But regardless, there's a declining trend and that trend has continued. So I was planning to do three years of field research during my PhD. And these are the three years uh, when that happened. Now, sort of lucky for me, and maybe I fell down or maybe I just got fortunate, but this was the one year that actually mattered to me. This was the summer when I was out driving around through the US collecting butterflies for my work. This is the year that I really needed there to be butterflies. And the year before there was hardly any, right? So I rolled the dice, I got really lucky. But it stung me in the ass because a few years later when I was doing field work for my postdoc, I did field work during this year and it was horrible especially when your whole plan is to go out and count eggs and caterpillars and there's none. Talk about a total bust, right? This is just the luck of the draw, but what do you do? What do you do when you fall down, right? You can try again, you can figure something out or you can you know, rely on other things that you sort of have, right? But these things happen. And when we're talking about populations, who knows what's gonna happen, right? It could be good years, could be really bad years. The other thing that happened is um, as things started to get more and more dire, the population trend became more apparent and you could sort of see these decadal levels that people started to plot. And then right around these really low population levels in here, um, some of my best friends started getting involved known as the three amigos. So when the population in, I don't even know what year that was, 2015, 2014 came out, like alarm bells went off, right? And these three dudes sat down together and literally talked about monarch butterflies. And they said, okay, what are we gonna do about this? This is a symbolic species. We have to do something about it. And they actually put um, sort of de facto legislation in that said, we're gonna work on this, right? Now for me, that was really fortunate because I was sort of at the tail ends of my PhD. I had these really cool models. I could tell us all sorts of things that nobody else could do. And here was sort of this like, really nice opportunity to do it, okay? Again, these are the things that just sort of happened. And somebody, uh, a couple of people in the US, much smarter than me, came up with this level. This is the target that we're gonna try and hit. It's gonna be six hectares, that's gonna be our goal. So I had other people, so I didn't have to defend this, saying this is our target. And I had a population model that would allow us to put a target in and say, this is what we need to do in order to, to conserve the species. So that worked out really good. So in February, 2010, uh, about six months after I started my PhD, this was my research proposal. And I'm sure you guys all have research proposals and they all sort of look the same sort of thing, right? You sort of lay it out and you say, this is what I'm going to do. And I went back and I looked at this um, about a year ago and I thought, holy cow, I actually like have fallen through, followed through with all of these. Um, but here's like sort of what it actually looks like. First thing is that I'm still here. I've been working on this stuff for almost 15 years. I'm not out of this schematic yet. Um, tying all your studies together 
right? So the study that I was going to do here was needed in this one. These were needed in this one. And this was needed in this one is really risky because if one of these boxes falls apart, what am I going to do, right? But it was strategic because once I did this and that went into this and then this went into this, nobody else can do this, right? I'm the one that has that. Yeah, sure. I can publish the papers and you guys can all read it. But I'm ready to take that next step. It's going to take somebody else six months or three years to sort of get to that point, right? I was trying to set myself up to sort of be the person uh, on call. The third thing is that I actually had to put another study in here because I had a really good uh, advisor on my committee who said, you got to have this in here because if you don't have regulation populations, they, what do they do? They either go to infinity or they collapse, right? Exponential growth. And I was like, oh, that makes sense. So I had to add an extra study there. Um, study one, this is one I was out collecting butterflies in the U.S., and it was really fortunate, as I said, because the population was high that year and I could actually get butterflies, but it was traumatic. And that was because when you first start a field study that you've never done before, it's a new species, you're in Texas, of all places, and there's no butterflies in Texas. It's hard, right? Day after day, you're just like, oh my God, there's no butterflies, there's no butterflies. I haven't got shot yet and that's good, but this is not going well, right? And then after being there for nine days, I got a call that one of my best friends died. And I was like, oh my God, this whole PhD is falling apart, right? Traumatic. I still deal with sort of the aftershocks of that a little bit because I talked to my parents, I talked to his parents and I said, I can't come back. And they said, it's okay, keep going. But you feel guilt for that, right? Because that is a tough thing that you have to do. So that was a little like, oh boy, overwhelming. Um, the other one here was, this is the leader in the field who worked on monarchs. And I called him up and I was telling him what I wanted to do. And he said to me, and I quote, it can't be done. It's too complex. We've been trying to do this for 10 years so far. He basically said, don't do it. It's a stupid idea. But this was my motivation because he said, we've been trying to do this for 10 years. And I thought, well, you're doing it wrong. Like, right i know it can work but you got okay so that was sort of like this motivation but at the same time this is the dude that's going to be reviewing the papers right that's always an important part of the calculation okay so that's fine and then i also had people say um for the population model and the conservation part of it no uh it's too big of a system it's too hard and besides we already know what to do which i found hilarious right it's like oh we, we know what the answer is but we just don't have the data yet has anybody run into that before and working with cats it's even more right people are like oh we know what they do like well where's the data oh we don't collect data but we know the answer already that's not how this works okay fine um and then the other one was there's too much variation in the data for you to be able to measure this i.e these are insects and nothing you produce is actually going to be useful so this is sort of like the obstacles that you go through, right? People sort of putting up barriers and they're being helpful, right? Saying, oh, you know, we've thought about this. We've tried to do it or whatever. So you have to like take that really, uh, you have to take that information, decide what you're going to do with it, right? Either it's like you put the brakes on because it's really good advice or you use it as motivation to get yourself up at four in the morning to get out in the field or whatever it takes to get it done, right? But it's important that you think about this because this is both a cost and an opportunity. Okay, so here's an opportunity, but it's delicate. Okay, so, oh yeah. And over here, as some of you know from lunch, like I'm still working on this and I'm falling down and it's really hard <laughs> because like life gets complicated at some points. Okay, great. So let's talk about these studies really quickly um, with respect to the conservation of monarch butterflies. So. This is me down in Texas catching butterflies. This is my dad. So when all of this happened, right, I called my parents up and my dad's like, I'm coming down. Pick me up in Dallas. You don't have to do that. He's like, I'm already out the door. So I drove to Dallas, picked up my dad. Hilarious. You want to see something funny? Watch your retired dad run after butterflies. <laughs> 
hilarious. We still talk about it. It's one of the greatest experiences we had together. It was fantastic. Okay. So 2011 went out and collected 800 butterflies, analyzed uh, those guys for carbon and hydrogen isotopes, um, and used spatially explicit Bayesian assignment models. Some of you guys will sort of know what that means, but basically we're going to use the butterflies to figure out their migratory connectivity. And we were doing it at monthly intervals. So each month we sort of collected a sample and you'll see this later on, but this is sort of like the sampling approach. And at the time, right, some really smart people at Guelph, or no, sorry, at here in Saskatoon had developed um, isotopes, right? And using spatially explicit surfaces, right? Keith Hobson, Len Wassner, the folks over at the hydrology lab, right? This was all set up. So I knew it could be done, but nobody had done it yet. That's a really good thing, right? Where it's like, okay, I just have to put the hard work in to catch butterflies in Texas and then do the assignments because nobody's done it so far. Okay, we can do that, great. Okay, so this is what it looks like. When you take those butterflies, you analyze them for isotopes, and then you build this sort of surface of where these butterflies come from. And this is the scale between very few individuals and a lot of individuals, okay? The red dots are where I collected the butterflies. Up at the top is the month or the interval that we're thinking about. So these are monthly intervals or generations of, of monarchs. So the overwintered butterflies, these are butterflies coming north out of Mexico, and this is where I caught them. They came from this area of the United States, central US. So they were born last fall, migrated to Mexico, and then were coming north in the spring when I caught them, okay? The next month in May, I was catching the first offspring. So these are the eggs laid by these guys that had developed into butterflies and started flying. Red, air, red dots are where I caught them. Uh, this heat map is where they came from, okay? So basically what we're gonna do is we're gonna do a step month by month and sort of see where they're coming from and where they're going. So in June, same sort of thing. The collection is where the butterflies are at that month, right? And again, the heat map is where they're coming from. Same with July. You can see the number of butterflies is going up because they breed and there's more of them and it's easier. August, same sort of thing. They're coming from the central uh, US for the most part, southern Canada. And then these butterflies, most of these came from this sample down here in Texas. But it basically shows that all those butterflies are from up here. These are breeding butterflies, right? So we actually have butterflies up here that we think as fall migratory butterflies that weren't migratory. They were actually just flying south and breeding further south. So that's a really useful and neat insight that up until this point, people hadn't really recognized. Okay. So the, the really nice thing about that is you can publish that paper in itself, but it also contributes to understanding if you make circles and arrows uh, that you're gonna need for a model, sort of what it looks like, right? So here's the collection areas in the yellow, and here's the boxes each month, right? Color-coded boxes showing where butterflies are coming from and going to, and you can produce this matrix here, which tells you where butterflies originate from and where they're going to, right? So if you think about your isotope data, this is what you're basically looking for, right? They're coming from these areas and they're going to those areas. And if you work with birds, you're thinking they're coming from breeding areas and they're going to overwintering areas, right? For these guys, because we have multiple generations, they're coming from different breeding areas and they're going to different breeding areas. But it produces this matrix. And we're gonna need this later on. And we can do this for each month as we go along. And the thickness of those arrows is basically the proportion of butterflies and where they're coming from. So you can see this pattern, right? They're moving north and then they're starting to move south, which fits the life history of the species. So that's good, right? When the data sort of aligns with, with what you think reality is. Okay, great. So the next study is population regulation. This is somewhat boring, except I spent a summer in a greenhouse, which is always fun. It's helped a little bit as I'm growing my own boreal forest, but it involved um, growing milkweed plants, putting eggs on those plants at different densities, and then watching how they develop, grow, uh, and mature. These are caterpillars that have eaten all the plants, and they get to the point where they start eating the stems, and then they start eating each other, right? But this is science. This is how we understand the feedback between competition and survival, right? This is with density dependence is. Um, and this is all really simple stuff, right? Different densities with replicates, uh, generalized linear models, Fairly straightforward stuff, right? Not really hard, not really groundbreaking or anything like that. 
But the good news, I lied, there is one statistic, is that this is a significant relationship between the density of monarchs down here and their survival to become adults. And really importantly is we can put that into a nice neat equation. And the only thing that we need here to understand survival is density. And the density is the number of eggs divided by the number of milkweed plants. Milkweed are the host plants on the landscape, okay? But that's really important because now we have sort of a feedback in a model that won't allow a population to go to uh, infinity or to extinction. Okay, great. Uh, and the other fun thing is that when you apply this to field densities that people had measured in the field, you get this sort of relationship where you can see that as you go from early breeding era, early times of the breeding season to middle to late, you actually have higher and lower survival rates based on where you are, right? So again, this is the geographic and the temporal component of understanding monarch populations, right? And this will all come together in the end. So I'm sort of laying this out. So these densities come from these areas where people had gone out and counted the number of eggs on plants. And then we, I just took the same thing and just color coded it. So you know that we're talking about these different regions more or less, okay? Again, this sort of builds on this other component, right? So now we have two studies, independent studies that have the same color coding that contribute to this sort of structure, right? Yeah, I do, yeah. And that's because if you think about over the course of the season, the number of butterflies that are in those different regions, so there's very few butterflies in the northern region early on. Right? So you see a very high sort of mortality rate, which means that the density is really high, but that's because there are very few plants at that time, right? So this is the proportion that would survive, and you would, to get a population response, multiply that by the population size, right? So you can have higher mortality, but the number of individuals up there is so small, right? So that's a really good observation, right? You sort of look at that, and you think, well, it doesn't really totally jive. But the important thing is that it doesn't take into account the number of individuals that are actually there. The other important thing is just to have this structure, right? To say that over space and time, we have these sort of feedbacks, right? And people that work on migratory connectivity will think about seasonal dynamics, right? And how individuals might be uh, crowded. They might move to a different lo location. There's feedbacks between the different seasons. Okay, study number two is uh, a matrix population model. So here are the inputs that we need, and I'll show you sort of the formula, which is not super overwhelming. Uh, we need estimates of migratory connectivity, including the geography and the life history. Um, and that basically feeds into this sort of plot of the movement uh, that I showed you before in terms of um, where the butterflies are at different times. Now, within each one of these boxes, right? So this is a box within, let's say, the central region in September, you have these population dynamics. And if you guys have taken intro population uh, ecology uh, courses, you will recognize this. This is sort of like a matrix population, standard matrix population model, right? But it's important to recognize that that sort of model where you go from different life history stages, right? And there's feedback with respect to survival and reproduction happens in each box at each time step. That's the important thing. You need all those components together uh, for it to make sense. So uh, we also need spatiotemporal survival and reproduction. Thankfully, there's fairly good data on that for monarchs. And we need population monitoring. And as I showed you right at the beginning, we have people in Mexico monitoring the population long-term. So we sort of have this uh, I guess, benchmark of does our population model spit out a number that's relative to what we're seeing over time, right? Does it actually represent reality? Okay, so here's um, sort of the methods. And this is a basic population model up at the top. This is the standard matrix population model that you guys probably would have seen in sort of intro courses and that most people use. The bottom part here is taking matrix a and busting it up into a bunch of different things. And this is where 
Uh, I would argue if you're interested in migratory connectivity and the conservation of migratory animals, this is where you want to listen because this is where it actually comes together. So within each one of these A matrices, we actually have four matrices. Matrix M, which is up here, represents the migratory connectivity. So this is the connectivity between this place and that place, non-breeding and breeding, or breeding and non-breeding, right? So think about your circles and arrows based on your isotope data or what have you. This is where it fits in, right here. The second one, oh, within each one of these M's, we also have this. So this is the transition based on life stage between the different regions. We don't need to know those details at this point. The second part is the demography, right? And this is the standard sort of population model stuff, right? Births, deaths, uh, reproduction, things like that. Within this larger B, you have each B <clears throat> and each B here. This is the matrix uh, formulation for that circles and arrows schematic that we just saw, right? This is what you would typically see uh, in a population model that you're probably all familiar with. So this is how we uh, we mix them together, I would say, to account for both migratory connectivity and uh, demography. The good thing about matrix models is you can do perturbation analysis. So you can look at things like population viability. Does the population likely to go uh, extinct at a given time interval? And the second is perturbation analysis, which in my mind is like the really good stuff, okay? The equations are horrific because this is matrix calculus, but it's fine because we have computer programs that can do this for us, okay? MATLAB, R can't do this, as far as I know. MATLAB can. But it basically tells you with infinite small movements in your parameter of choice, survival of uh, third instar larvae in Tennessee, what's the impact on the population size overall? This is what we want to know because it tells us which attributes actually drive this system. Okay, so when you produce a model like this, it takes you a long time, but when you come out with this model, it's really exciting because you can use uh, sensitivity to look at what are the factors that drive this population. And the big conversation was, well, all this mortality in Mexico is what's driving this system. If you look at the demographic rates in Mexico compared to all the breeding regions together, it says the complete opposite. It's what's happening on the breeding grounds that drive this population. This population is declining because of what's happening up here, not because of what's happening down here. So that is like a huge step because up until this point, everybody was swearing at each other and fighting and saying, we have to do stuff in Mexico, even though they had already protected that area 30 years ago. Okay, great. But we can actually diagnose a little bit further. We can go down to the different regions as well. And we can say, okay, which of these regions is more important? And from this result, the central region of the US comes out as being the most important. And you know, for us up in Canada, not so much. So this is both good and bad, I suppose, right? One is it says that uh, we can diagnose who's contributing what and where. Uh, but the second is that in Canada, we actually don't have that much pull on the population as a whole, which is really important in my mind particularly when you think about where monarchs are listed as endangered. The other good thing about a population model is that you can use it to project forward and say what's going to happen over time. Uh, these points and whiskers are the population decline over, let's say, 100 years, population size on the left here. And this line up here is the extinction probability above a threshold, right? And as I said before, we have a threshold that's been determined already, so we can compare those things. So these are really useful things for for planners to be able to look at um, what they might do. And of course, we can also run simulations with different things. If we remove the effect of genetically modified crops that take out um, weed species like milkweed, host plants, uh, if we remove that as a way of managing them, we get larger populations that are still declining over time and we have lower extinction thresholds as well. So this provides one sort of um, theoretical idea, right? If we ban the use of GMO crops, this is the outcome. Is it worth it? That's a question for decision makers to make, right? And society as a whole. But this is the underlying model that we need to actually figure that out. Okay, 
And then really quickly, I'm going to talk about this last step. This is stuff that I'm actually running on my computer like right now. So <clears throat> it doesn't look as good and the take home message isn't as clean as it probably should be. But this is based on observations that we have uh, in Southern Ontario of date here and the number of eggs per plant, which again is a density metric, right? And that's important because we have that in our population model. And if we go out and we mow those roadsides at different intervals during the course of the summer, how many uh, eggs per plant do we get? And this response follows what we would expect. And we've seen another data suggesting that once you mow a milkweed and it starts to regrow, the female monarchs love it. They go and they lay a ton of eggs on those plants, which suggests to me, okay, if you can mow at the right time, given that you have influxes of monarchs in different places at different times, you can actually optimize that. You can both mow for management purposes and get more monarchs out of the deal, right? And so these data suggest that to get the highest peak is sort of in here, which is somewhere about the second or third week of July, okay? So that just tells us the density, but it doesn't actually give us the feedback in terms of how many monarchs are we killing when we mow? Because when we mow, everything goes through the blender, right? Eggs, caterpillars, they all go through the blender. And these equations require uh, a cost-benefit analysis. So here's the part that is not sort of super clear. If we use a, a matrix model, very similar to the one I just showed you, we add this parameter H, which for people that study waterfowl, H is harvest, okay? And harvest is whether you're shooting them out of the air or you're grinding them up with a, a lawnmower. But basically what it does is it takes out a proportion of the population, right? So this means that if we have, let's say four life stages and these are eggs and larvae, and these are flying adults, right? When we go through and we mow, we take out the eggs and the larvae, but the adults are fine. And when that happens on the right-hand side here, we have our different life stages, egg, different instars of the insect as they develop, pupae. And then we have three types of, four types of adults. Pre-reproductive adults, so these are ones that have you closed and they can't breed yet because they take about five days to start breeding. Reproductive adults, these are the ones that are dropping eggs, right? Good to go. Newly arrived individuals are these individuals that are coming from further south, right, to repopulate because we're talking about a migratory species. And then we have uh, diapause adults. And these are, as you get further in the year, how many adults are in diapause that ultimately fly to Mexico where the population is measured, right? This is what we care about when it comes to what type of impact are we having and what's the potential benefit of doing this. The red line is where we would mow, right? So using sort of basic simulations right now, it suggests that the optimal time to mow is sort of in this, I think third or fourth week of July, slightly different than the graph we just saw sort of with that maximum point, but it suggests that there's an optimal time to mow, right? And another metric we could get out of this is how many monarchs are we grinding up and killing for the potential output that we have. And this is why this part is important. This is sort of the last, the last slide. This is why it's important. I had a conversation with somebody from Environment and Climate Change Canada. Uh, no, yeah, Canadian Wildlife Service. And I said, what this model is gonna say is it's beneficial to kill monarchs. And she said, we can't do that. This is an endangered species. It's illegal to kill monarchs. I said, and there's the rub. You guys are gonna have to figure out what to do with this. I'm just telling you what the model says and what is actually happening. Now there's underlying assumptions that I think we need to test in the field. They're gonna hold up, it's not a big deal. But this is telling us that it's actually beneficial to go and kill monarchs because you get more out at the end, right? This is causes real problems when it comes to working with an endangered species where you can't do that. And what's the solution, right? Yeah, I would too. But the problem is that when you start making exceptions, then everything becomes an exception, right? Well, what's the exception for caribou? What's the exception for this? What's the exception for that, right? 
Yeah. You would think so, but it's as the person on the other end of the call said to me, she's like, this causes severe problems at our end. Right, because each exception, i.e. each mowing needs to happen on a per user basis. Can you imagine how many sort of permits they would have to give out for this? And like, it gets to the point where it's just like, oh boy. And my solution, which is not based in sort of policy is, well, what if you provided a window, right? Given a certain latitude or a certain location, this is the window when you should mow. Would that work? She said, no, that wouldn't work either. I said, okay, well, <laughs> that's all I got. Like, you know, but I can tell you the benefits of sort of doing that. But it basically said to her, like, uh, you know, you guys are going to be wasting money or doing less, uh, having less impact if you don't allow the killing of monarchs. There's the intersection of ecology and conservation biology and policy, right? Like it's beauty. I love it. I love it. I saw this coming from like four years ago, five years ago, because I was like, as soon as I saw that lump of there's more eggs on a plant after it's been mowed, I'm like, well, there it is. I know generally what's going to happen, right? Here's sort of the guts and the glory of it with a population model. But it's not like rocket science, right? Like you guys, I'm sure in your work say, well, I sort of know what the answer is going to be or intuitively this makes sense, right? And then actually demonstrating it is another thing. But I always knew that I was going to have to make this lob to the person in policy and just say, like, here's the deal. And earlier this year, it wasn't a big deal until earlier this year when the Canadian government listed monarchs as endangered. So now we have an endangered species in Canada that you can't kill, right? Except unless you have a permit. And I'm telling you, we should go, we should kill them all, right? At a certain time. It causes like a really big problem. But it also provides an opportunity because in the United States, we sort of run into the same sort of issue, right? Where we can say there's going to be this moving window over space and time of the best time to mow, right? And that mowing uh, happens for a variety of reasons. We don't just do it for, for fun. We do it for usually for public safety, right? Because we can't have very long grass in roadsides because it's a site hazard sometimes, right? They also do it for other management reasons. One is ticks, believe it or not, in some places, right? Whole bunch of reasons why people mow and when they do it. But what I'm going to get at is say, well, if you're gonna mow anyways, here's the best time to do it. And here's the relative benefit of doing that over mowing at other times or not mowing at all. So that's how I do my science, right? I sort of lay things out in a way where one leads to the next, leads to the next, leads to the next. And I kind of have an idea of how it's going to go. And, you know, in the bio, one of the lines was linking population dynamics to economic models to understand the, um, the price, whatever I said, right? How do we turn this into dollars and bills? Because that's what people want to know. How much is this going to cost me? And what am I going to get for it, right? That's how governments work. That's how businesses work. That's how we all work, like, really. At the end of the day, we think about dollars and bills like we really, really do, right? And we need to start thinking about conservation within the economic framework of, of all of this, right? It's super hard to do. But I think, in my mind, and I'm really biased, but I think that this is the approach to do it. I really like these models. I think that they're really flexible and really useful uh, for migratory animals. And we already have a lot of the data already to do it, right? Even if it's like really rough, we can usually draw maps of where subpopulations go, right? We can sort of guesstimate the proportions that move to different areas. We can sort of guesstimate the survival and the reproduction, right? And really that's all you need to be able to produce a model at first. And you can get a lot out of that, right? Before having to fill it with field data and sort of peer reviewed literature that takes a lot of time to do, right? So there's a lot of sort of pre-work that can be done. And I do this a lot, right? I build models and I'm like, oh, well, what happens if I do this? There's the outcome. What happens if I do this? There's the outcome. So I sort of know the direction that things are going to go, right? And I could have told you that this was going to happen, not only just intuitively, but from the model, because I had sketched it up a year ago, right? I knew that this was going to happen. I just didn't know sort of the magnitude. And that's what I'm working on right now, is figuring out that magnitude, right? 
because ultimately their government is going to have to decide like should we allow people to do this what's the benefit of doing that is it three percent maybe not is it 50 percent maybe we do but how does that feed into that year-round population model when the elasticity of northern areas like canada don't contribute very much right that's sort of the next step is take this flip it back into the year-round population model right and again these are like all steps and there's another like five or six steps that i haven't talked about but i have them in my brain in terms of like oh what's going to be the next thing what's going to be the next thing so that's it um thank you for listening i really hope that if you study migratory connectivity and you're interested in these sorts of ideas of like how do you structure a population model i'd really like to talk to you because i think that not very many people have sort of taken this approach and it baffles me because i'm like it can be done people just haven't done it for your critter yet but it can be done you could do it like this weekend more or less thank you Um, we have kind of like one question because <laughs> we got to vacate this room. Um, but thank you so much. Yeah, no great. problem. Um, and before you leave, remember to fill out your name out for the draw. Uh, they can't win an unnamed amount. <laughs> <laughs> so question one for her. <laughs> sure. <laughs> now. <laughs> Um, I'm not sure whether I need to do something, but I'm wondering what do you think the food is the environment factor that is present in the population? This is like my first question. Um, my second question is that I guess your classification about like how central and as well as are they about food and elastic purposes. I was wondering if this event or if you would be classified as like, for example, mountain ranges followed by climate change. Yep. Or political boundaries. Right, that's one of the major criticisms. Like, well, this northern area includes both the US and Canada, right? So the trade-off there is that the geographic resolution with the isotopes uh, can parse out these three strips, right? Differentiating between Southern Ontario and Northern Minnesota is really hard. So that's sort of this trade-off balance between having the data to actually find some structure versus having something that isn't as useful as it would be if it was a political boundary or other geographic regions for whatever reason. The other question, what's the factor that's most likely driving this? So that's a really good question. So we've seen massive declines in milkweed and the feeling is that it's probably milkweed driven, but there's still billions of milkweed out there. My gut feeling is that it has to do with the dispersion of that milkweed on the landscape. If you see really dense clumps of milkweed, you find just males. They're just patrolling those areas. They're looking for females that are going across the landscape. And when they come in, they try and mate with those females. The females are looking for widely dispersed milkweed, right? They're trying to drop eggs in like a really dilute sea of milkweed. Males are trying to get like, well, where do I have the best chance of like having an area where I can eventually come across a female? Females are operating differently. I think that's what it is because you've gone from sort of this sea of low density milkweed to areas where there's no milkweed at all, except in roadsides or in strips. And in the strips, they're usually really dense because they've been growing there for years or decades. And you have these really dense congregations. So I think that there's like two facts. One is that the milkweed has disappeared, but also that the structure of what it looks like on the landscape has changed dramatically. We don't have models for that yet. That's just like my gut feeling. Yeah, it is. Yeah, yeah, they're all native species, so weeds, and they're on the noxious weed list. And up until a couple of years ago, they were on the noxious weed list in Ontario, right? Yeah, I mean, it. <sighs> There's nobody waiting, so does anyone have help? Yeah, we can talk about this later, but like there's no, a there's whole... There's no one waiting, like we're good. Okay, yeah. there's like a whole thing here in terms of like... Farmers get rid of noxious weeds because they reduce um, yields, right? That's sort of the take-home message. That's why we use Roundup. That's why we do these things. Okay, where's the data? There's no data. There's no data on milkweed and uh, corn yields. 
I'm sure that Roundup, because they are a multinational billion dollar corporation, has those data because their whole business model is centered around that assumption. And I've talked to people at Monsanto and I've talked to people at uh, Syngenta. No, yeah, I think so. I'm like, where's the data? And they're like, oh, we have it. I'm like, it doesn't say. It doesn't say what it's supposed to say, does it? Not with respect to milkweed. Probably does with other noxious weeds, right? That I can understand. But, oh, I would love to get that data. I would love to get it. But again, what would the end result be? It'd be like, oh, well, we got to put milkweed back in agricultural field. That's a big battle to try and pick with farmers, right? Is it worth it? I don't know. But that's my, that's my gut feeling. I would love for somebody to be able to hack into that data set. So could we like drill down and figure out what the butterflies are actually? Yeah. So that's a, a good point. So we could, and there's a woman out of Iowa that did some of that work. The problem is that the monarchs are moving over fairly long distances. So they're probably moving anywhere from like one to 10 kilometers a day, the females that are looking for, for milkweed. Right. And the other challenge is that they're really small. So putting transmitters on them is really hard. Because once you put that transmitter on them, they have a really hard time flying. Well, I think it's like, it's fun. 